Five. And we're live. Tony Ortega, what is the latest in the Danny Masterson trial? Andrew, it's a really interesting situation. On Friday, after two and a half days of deliberations, uh, Judge Charlene Almeida let us know that the uh, jury had been unable to come up with a verdict. She's asked them to come back after the holiday. And I think that's what people were surprised by, that you know we were going to have to take this long break. Because actually, two and a half days of deliberations after five weeks of testimony is not unusual. But you know, the, I think the surprising thing, what caught us all by surprise, was she said that the jury had been unable to come up with verdicts on all three of the counts. I think people sort of suspect that they may have made up their mind about one or two and were just struggling with a third. But no, they can't agree on all three. And just real quick, you know, I know in England sometimes I get questions. In our system here in the United States, it has to be a unanimous verdict for either conviction or acquittal. And if, if they keep deliberating and keep deliberating at some point, they just cannot agree, then the judge will declare them dead and declare a mistrial. But we're not there yet. I know I use the word deadlock in my headline. A lot of other people did, but the judge didn't. She's not saying this is a deadlock jury yet. She just wants them to come back in a week and try again. My, it's such a weird thing, the whole, I mean, legal systems, I mean, whatever the system is in any country, there's always something where you go, what, that doesn't, like the fact that both in the US and the UK, we use juries at all is a strange thing. Although the alternative, I suppose, is to have a judge who could just be, you know, open to being bribed or whatever it might be. It's a very, very strange. And that what you just told me that either everyone agrees, or no one does, or it's just the person doesn't get punished then. So that I suppose that's that movie, isn't it? What was that movie called? Something 12 men in a room or something? Angry, uh, 12 angry men but let me but let me spell <laughs> let me spell out the scenarios just so you're aware so you know in our system we want these jurors to come to a unanimous decision either for conviction or for acquittal and danny's facing three counts of forcible and if he's found guilty of all three he's looking at 45 years to life in prison um now they they can't agree so far but again i want to stress it's only been two and a half days it's not unusual after five weeks of testimony. So they'll come back in a week, start again. Now, uh, if they cannot agree after some time and it's unclear when, what that's going to be, the next step would they would be allow the uh, attorneys to question the jurors a little bit to see if they could figure out if there was some issues they could clear up. But then if they still can't agree after that, then the judge would declare a hung jury and, and say that um, it's a mistrial. In that yeah. case, it's up to the prosecutor whether or not to refile the case and have another trial like next spring and put everyone through it all over again. So this is why we really want these jurors to figure it out and come up with a decision either for uh, guilty or innocent. So that's, that's what we're facing. But again, I just want to caution people that, you know, two and a half days is really kind of quick for such a, a lengthy trial and that let's give this jury a chance to figure things out in a week. So this is just for anyone not aware of the case. It's, we're talking about Danny Masterson from that 70s show. Because this is YouTube and they have very stringent rules around certain words, uh, we've got to try not to use the R word as much as possible for what he okay. for what he did to several Scientology women. But Tony, would you take us through what he, what are those three charges? Right. So um, I first broke the news in March 2017 that the Los Angeles Police Department was investigating Masterson over the allegations of three women. Uh, shortly after that, a fourth woman also joined the investigation. Uh, it wasn't until 2020, however, that the DA's office did charge him on those three counts. And the reason why Scientology is such an important part of this case is not only is Danny Masterson an actor known for that 70s show, but he's a well-known Scientology celebrity. He grew up in the church. He's in a large family of Scientologists. And all three women the first three in the investigation and the three that he's facing charges on were Scientologists at the time. They're not today. Uh, the incidents are between 2001 and 2003. And part of the case about why it's taken so long for those charges to reach trial is that the women have testified about being terrified of Scientology, that in Scientology, you're not supposed to turn in a fellow Scientologist and that they, you know, discourage the use of the R word, as we're saying. So uh, that's been definitely been part of the case. And it's, and I think that's what's generated a lot of interest in, in the trial. 
is there has been a lot of testimony about Scientology. Now, there's been other stuff about Scientology that's not been allowed in. And I know people are a little frustrated about that. But the judge has tried to keep things focused pretty tightly on Danny, the allegations, and the women's state of mind and why they didn't come forward a little sooner. Some They did go to the church. They did go to the church right away. And they were discouraged from going to law enforcement. So that's part of the story. Did Have we seen much of... Uh, Scientology's involvement in this trial day by day are they are people f representatives there at all yeah definitely and it was uh, very obvious there was a preliminary hearing last year the first time these women got to testify and Scientology's attorney was sitting in the front row right next to me and uh, then this time and and then the the her he had, Danny had different attorneys then a year ago he had the famous Tom Mesereau who's the defense attorney who handled Michael Jackson and Robert Blake and Bill Cosby. Um, and there's just no question that some things Mesereau did in that hearing a year ago were had to have been influenced by David Miscavige and the Church of Scientology. There's just no question. He was fired, and then Danny brought on this new attorney, Philip Cohen, and Cohen made it, he said it many times, even before trial started, I'm not going down that same road. I'm a different attorney. And he has tried his best to keep Scientology out of the trial. Um, but Scientology wants to keep an eye on it. So they have had representatives in the audience every day from the very beginning. Some of them have not identified themselves, but we figured out who they were. Uh, but definitely Scientology has had a representative every single day of the trial. I'm sure they're reporting back to Miscavige what their impressions are. I saw Aaron Smith Levin. He put up a photo um, of in clear water of somebody wearing gloves, and he said that's how you identify a Scientologist. Have you heard that? No, I mean Scientology um, at their facilities are still wearing gloves, and I think that's what it's a reference to. It's got nothing to do with the trial. The, the, these were mm. attorneys. These were attorneys, well-dressed attorneys, sitting in the audience. Uh, and they weren't, as far as I know, they weren't Scientologists. I'm just saying they represented Scientology okay. in the trial. Yeah. Do do they? Rec I mean, you are, I, I think, the preeminent journalist on on the Scientology beat. Uh, do they recognize you? Do you get bad looks? Yeah, they know who I am. I mean, uh, I'm not looking to be part of the case. They've tried to bring me in a couple of times. They actually subpoenaed me last year at the preliminary no hearing, and uh, we got that quashed. And then. Um, you know, they they knew who I am, and they've one of them actually said hi, Tony, to me, and I don't. <laughs> one of the Mastersons. So, you know, they they know who I am, and, and I I don't, uh, you know, I see some things written about them and how they looked and how stressed they are. I have to say, you know, Danny Maston is facing some horrific charges, and there's been a lot of evidence supporting those charges, but in the courtroom. I think the Masterson family has been fine. I know some people disagree with me and think that they've given evil eyes, stuff like that. But I, I just see, you know, a family supporting their son and um, they they really haven't done anything unusual except just show, in, show up in such large numbers. Are we talking about, I mean, the brother, another, one of the brothers is from Malcolm in the Middle. He was the one in the army from that show. Is that right? Right. So the, the people who typically come, some, there's a little difference day to day, but the people who typically tom, come are Carol Masterson, Danny's mother. Um, Danny's biological father, Peter Masterson, I only saw one day, and that was at closing arguments. I understand he's not well, okay. but uh, I think he was there that day. Now, um, uh, and then he and Carol split up many, many years ago. So Carol and Peter have two children. Danny Masterson and Christopher Masterson. And Christopher was on Malcolm in the Middle. Carol remarried to a man named Joe Raish, who was a Scientologist. They have two children, Jordan and Alana. Jordan was a recurring character on Last Man Standing. And um, uh, Alana was a recurring character on, uh, I don't know if it was The Walking Dead or one of the spinoffs. But they're all actors, okay. all four of them. And then they also have a half-brother, Will Masterson, who's um, Peter's son, but not Carol's son. And so all five of those siblings have been coming. Also, uh, Danny's married to Bijou Phillips, and her two sisters, China Phillips uh, and, and Mackenzie Phillips, have been coming most days, not every day. Uh, okay. And that's been interesting uh, for me as well. Um, 
and they just sit there with all together in the family section and support each other. Hmm. It's a really oh, difficult one. Also, China China is married to Billy Baldwin, and Billy Baldwin has come a few times, especially in the last few days. Yeah. Okay, that's the brother of Alec, who I, I think often has like a, a fringe and is in. Was he in um, no not No Country for Old Men? The other one, the Coen Brothers film. Uh, oh, brother, we're out thou. Is that him? I you are testing my. I'm sorry. Billy Baldwin. I'm not an entertainment reporter, and that's yeah, the problem. But, is they've had other people in there, and I'm like, who are these people? I don't know. I think he was potentially in. People will correct me. I'm sure. I'm, I think he was in that. Oh, maybe it's not him. Actually, I'm thinking it might be thinking of someone who looks just like him. I'm not sure. Someone will tell me about that. It doesn't matter. I mean, the, the, I guess the, the 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 thing here is. I mean, this is a, this is a family of influence. Obviously, that's why it's 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 important to an extent. I mean, it's important because of the crimes committed. But I mean, over the years, there was Cosby. There's uh, all, all sorts of different actors and things. And this is another person who's getting, you know, was getting away with it for a long time. Well, what I was told uh, well before the trial started was that, the, that this is an incredibly tight family and they would stick by D uh, Danny no matter what. Uh, and they've proved it. They've been there in court every day. Hmm. It's a really difficult one, though, isn't it? I, I suppose if your son or daughter has done something horrific, but they're, you know, you want to support them no matter what, I suppose, fam. I I, it's just complicated, isn't it? Well, I'm sure they're telling each other that this is a terrible judge, that the women are all lying. Um, you know, that's just how, that's human nature. I mean, they're not sitting there thinking, well, Danny's a monster, but he's within our family, so we're going to sit here. I mean, that's just not how it works. Some families do, don't they? I don't know. I don't have kids, so I don't know what that's like. <laughs> <laughs> the confirmation bias is involved. Right. I no, I, I, I don't fault them for showing up in numbers. I'm not sure that it affects the jury at all. The jury seem like real normal folks and, you know, middle class, working class. And I don't get the sense that they would really be impressed by this group because they probably don't know who they are. Interesting. I, I saw you sort of uh, I, I, answering suggestions on Twitter and things. People were saying, could they have put a Scientologist in the jury? Yeah, it's natural for people to wonder that. I, I think it's a, a very remote chance. Um, I was there during jury selection when... Uh, Judge Olmedo was speaking to each individual juror and she was asking them about Scientology and they would, you know, say, they, oh, I've heard of it, that kind of thing. Is it possible that Scientology somehow got a, a, a Scientologist through that process? I think the chances are pretty small. But the other thing I want people to understand is with these kinds of uh, allegations and, um, you know, assault allegations and they've taken place quite a while ago. It's not an easy case to make, even with all the evidence you've got. There are jurors who may resist the idea of convicting on something like this. And also, I think it's interesting that they are unable to agree on all three. What that tells me is that it's not the particular women's stories or testimony. It's maybe the concept itself of, you know, uh, allegation. So, you know, it, it's... Um, again, I think it's too early. I think there is a chance we come back after a week get them deliberating again, and they can come to some agreement. What Do you have an inkling into what kind of things, uh, because I suppose they could have just come back all 12 and gone, yep, he's guilty, which is what I guess we, or at least I expected them to say. I mean, was this a shock to you? And what kinds of things do you think that they might be unsure about? Well, uh, you know, I thought the prosecution did a very good job. Uh, these women testified very well under pressure. There were interesting corroborating witnesses. The main thing the prosecution was trying to, I think, uh, undercut was a defense suggestion that these women had somehow colluded together. And that's why they had witnesses come on to uh, describe these women talking about the attacks years before they even knew about each other. So they were trying to kind of prevent that sort of interpretation. But then on the, on the defense side, uh, defense attorney Philip Cohen in his cross-examination did his best to bring up small differences between what the women said years ago in a police investigation versus what they said on the stand. Now, some of it felt kind of minor to me and some of the other journalists, we all wondered if it was effective. Like, for example, the Jane Doe 4, she's not, her allegations are not charged, but she was a another sort of past, what they call a past bad acts witness to also show a pattern. Um, you know, she um, had said, you know, she, when she went to Danny's for this party after a filming, um, she had three glasses of wine and he said, well, you know, five years ago, didn't you do an interview and you told the police that it was five glasses? So we're oh. sitting there thinking, okay, is it three glasses or five glasses? 
Do either one of them excuse what he's accused of doing? You see what I'm saying? So some of it felt kind of minor that way. But what he was trying to do was plant in the jury's mind that these women are exaggerating over time. And so the small details change. And let me tell you, Andrew, that's what a defense attorney would do in any case like this. That's got nothing to do with Scientology. So, you know, that's that's what so you just have to wonder what is it that they're hung up on? We don't know. We don't know what the split is. Or is it things like that, small inconsistencies? Is it more the concept, you know, conviction? We don't know yet. And and we won't know uh, for a while yet. Man. When you say they're coming back after the holiday, what, what does that mean? Is this an American holiday? Yes. Yeah. Uh, on Thursday next week, we have what's called Thanksgiving. Right. And yes. it's, it's kind of a major holiday for Americans. And so um, a lot of people will take the whole week off. And that's why the judge decided... We're going to take the whole week next week because some of the jurors already have trips planned and come back on Monday the 28th and start up again. So we just hope these jurors follow their directions and don't read the news. And, you know, hopefully family members won't bring it up over Thanksgiving dinner. And uh, so we'll reassemble on November 28th and I'll fly back out to L.A. Oh, man, it's such a killer in a sense, isn't it? Because uh, for, for those women involved, it's so important that, that he, he be sentenced and locked up and and uh uh now there's another week you know another week of like oh thanksgiving and all that and i suppose even the masterson family do you get the sense at all do you watch danny do you watch his his face how often is he wearing them that mask i've seen him walk in with uh is he could he be nervous or is he like a robot you know um i give him credit he's had a poker face and he hasn't looked either too stressed or anything i know people keep telling me that it's that he's super stressed and his body language is bad, but I just feel like they're reading things into him. I almost ran right into him in the bathroom about an hour before the announcement on Friday. I was going in, he was coming out. I mean, we were inches from each other. And of course I've been around him for weeks now and I can tell you, he's just the same now. He's, you know, he has to be under stress, of course, but he's handling it well and he's not, you know, showing anything. Uh, We have seen that Bijou has teared up a couple of times. I'm sure the, Stress is, is, is a lot on her. But, you know, he's not misbehaved in any way. I know some witnesses have said he's made some faces at them. But another time when um, the actress uh, Jordan Ladd was up on the stand and she was asked to identify, because one of the things you do in American court is, is the person you're talking about in the courtroom, can you identify him? What is he wearing? And she was having a hard time. She didn't have reading glasses on to judge the color of his tie. And Danny held up his tie. Huh. So, you know, I mean, I know there are some people that feel that the, the, the Mastons have maybe made some slight aggressive moves in the courtroom, but I haven't seen it. I just think they've, you know, they're dealing with a difficult situation. And but one that, you know, if these allegations are true, he deserves to be going through these difficult situations. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, can you speculate about about whether they're true or do you prefer not to? Well, look, I'm. um the evidence that's been presented is interesting because it's consistent. Four different women who all describe attacks that have very similar things going on. They, Danny gave them something to drink, and then uh, within about a half hour, they were suspiciously intoxicated. And then they would be, the, be in and out of consciousness, and he was suddenly on top of them and behind them. And, you know, just the sort of consistency between these women. And again, There was evidence presented that they had told other people about these things before they ever knew about each other. So it wasn't like they got together and said, let's all make up a similar sounding story. So that's that's been kind of what's been coming out. So then, you know, the the, when the the defense attorney is asking Jane Doe four, was it three glasses or five glasses? And when he's asking Jane Doe two. Did you describe this to somebody as our case? And she said, no. I said, the case. Are you sure you didn't say our case? When you realize that, Andrew, you realize he's not disputing the events themselves. He's picking around at the corners, you know. So after five weeks, you got the feeling that there's no question these things happen. It's just a matter of what was the degree. Have the women described it accurately? And, you know, Danny didn't take the stand to describe his own, which in America is very, very common. The criminal defendant almost never takes a stand. Huh. And I also want to point out something. I've seen people wondering why the defense didn't put on a case 
Well, the defense did have a case, and that was cross-examining all of the prosecution witnesses. And that's really not unusual in our system that that would okay. be the entire defense case. So people were wondering, why didn't Danny put on some friends to talk about what a great guy he is? And I don't think that would have been a productive in a, in a, in a case like this. Especially because the bits and pieces I've heard about him is that, I mean, I know it's subjective, but he's, he's apparently not a very nice guy. Well, I mean, even the women themselves described him being very charming at times. And when they first mm. met him, of course, he was very charming and um, kind of the center of, he was always the center of the party. And it was always like, you know, Danny had this circle of friends that were just, you know, really loyal okay. to him and, and, and he could be a lot of fun. But then Jane Doe 3 was the one who was in an actual relationship with him. And she said, you know, after the first year, it was just really, she described just a very loveless relationship and, uh, uh, she she kind of pour, uh, painted a very grim portrait of him. Okay, which I suppose is not criminal, is it? You can be a terrible, horrible person, doesn't mean you committed the crimes. You know, the defense attorney actually said that in his opening statement. He oh, said, God. "You're gonna you're <laughs> gonna be here. You're gonna be hearing about rude behavior, terrible, you know, personality, all this stuff, and it just doesn't mean he committed these crimes." So they kind of he kind of set that up ahead of time. Okay, so that was his aim. And then also, as you were saying, to cast doubt about the stories and maybe suggest collusion between uh, the women. To what end? I don't know. I suppose revenge because he wasn't a nice lover. Um, well, see, now that's interesting because the defense previously had Mesro, like I said, Tom Mesro. The theory he was very open about uh, saying in court was that... Um, he believed this was a plot against Scientology orchestrated by Leah Remini. And she ah. had, you know, she had rounded up these women and they were inventing stories in order to bring down the Church of Scientology. The defense abandoned that uh, by the time of trial and um, that Philip Cohen wasn't going there at all. He was just he was just focusing on police statements they gave years ago and what they said on the stand, hoping to create doubt in the jury's mind that maybe these women's stories had, had been embellished over time so leah remini uh, for anyone who doesn't know that was the actress from king of queens which was big over here in the uk as well i think around the world um and she's a former scientologist um there was some talk as well at some point i think early on that she had jeopardized the trial i think by by putting up threads on twitter did that sort of make it to court yeah that was very funny because um one thing that so what are the, the way my method, Andrew, I mean, I knew I was going to be sitting there with great journalists from, you know, a dozen different publications and we all got to know each other. It was a lot of fun. Um, and I knew I tried to find a niche for myself with my little website. What can I do that's a little different? And what I ended up doing was just typing up everything everyone said and immediately releasing it out in the hallway after after every break. And uh, so my audience really felt like they were there. And one of the things that, that we all sort of, uh, that became quickly apparent was that defense attorney, Philip Cohen, was gonna move for a mistrial practically every day. It got to be kind of funny because he would, he would move for a mistrial over the slightest thing. And one of them was over the Halloween weekend, uh, Leah Remini had put out this tweet storm talking about the case, why isn't it getting more attention, et cetera, et cetera. And that Monday, when we came into court, Philip Cohen moved for a mistrial because she had done all this tweeting. And of course, the defense attorney, I mean, the uh, prosecutor and the judge were like, we're not reading Leah Remini. The jury's not reading Leah Remini. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But we, I just thought it was great. And I, I talked to her about that. She thought it was funny. The funny thing is, I mean, I do sort of get that argument because the jury may well have been, if, especially if they're doing this particular case. If I was in that jury, I'd go home straight away and i see what Leah Remini might be saying, right? And that might change how I feel about the case. Well, they're not supposed to do that. I mean, every day, she, multiple times, she gives yeah. them admonition saying, don't talk about the case. Don't do any research. Don't go online. Don't read anything. Don't watch anything. I mean, she tells them multiple times a day, every single day. So they know they're not supposed to do that. And... You know, we just we're just hoping they're following those instructions. Yeah. Do, you, do you, so? Do you talk to Leah Remini quite often? Is, is and, and so she is she sort of, you know, helping with with your reporting and stuff? Uh, I haven't uh, been speaking with her all that much, but recently, yes, because she not only put out that set of tweets, but then like a week later, 
we saw this amazing news about corruption in the Los Angeles Police Department that came out. Oh, and it yes. was related, it was related to it was something about CBS, but it was related to a captain that she and I have been talking about for years. He was Scientology's man at the LAPD. His name's Court Captain Corey Polka. And so we talked, Lee and I talked about that. And um, I made sure she knew about some emails of his that I've published. And then on November 6th, I think something like that, she put out this major tweet, tweets about that situation and said, look, if they're going to investigate this guy, they also need to investigate all the stuff he was involved with in Scientology, specifically Shelly Miscavige. She put those tweets out and they went viral. It was just, it, it was so, it caused such a stir that LAPD itself had to put out a statement which is really unusual. So um, that's, I then had her on my podcast and she and I talked about that. Um, but she's, she's um, she, sometimes she'll, she'll kind of go away from the Scientology for a while because she's got so many things going on. I mean, she's, you know, on television uh, with, a, with a game show and she's doing, you know, school and everything. But um, just recently she's been much more involved and we've been talking a bit, yeah. Oh, oh, that's great. Well, she seems very nice and she's probably the most, the most prominent ex-Scientologist there is. I've Ever. been desperate to get to get her on this on this show, but I don't want to. I won't burden you with your contacts, Tony. I, I, I was desperate to ask Mike Rinder when he came on as well, but I, I've heard that it, it. You know, and I know how that is. You don't you don't want to bother. Nobody wants to bother their one contact who's always getting bothered by everyone. So I'll have to find my way in now. I'll just keep right. tweeting at her and and stuff like that. But that was. A side note there, that's related to um, David Miscavige. He's the, the, the leader of Scientology, for those who don't know, and apparently used to always be seen with his wife, Shelley Miscavige, at all kinds of events. And maybe I'll let you tell, tell this story for the uninitiated. Yeah, so this is, I've been covering this story for more than 10 years now, and uh, I think I've done the most research on it. Um, David Miscavige and Shelley Miscavige ran Scientology together for quite a few years. And then, for whatever reason... Uh, in late August, early September 2005, he made her disappear. Now, we think we know where they're keeping her. It's a small mountain compound in the mountains above Los Angeles, actually in San Bernardino County. And, you know, everybody that knows the situation tells me that he'll just keep her there till she dies. He's just, for whatever reason, he's decided she's no longer a part of his orbit and, and he's just made her go away. And she can't even contact her own sisters. Uh, I've had family reach out to me and, and they've, I've guided them to which law enforcement agency to reach out to. And the law enforcement agency isn't doing anything about it. It's really amazing that the leader of an international organization that calls itself a church has been able to banish his wife to a small mountain compound for the last 17 years. And so Shelly, I mean, uh, Leah has done a great job bringing that back up to the forefront um, and putting out, you know, making people aware of it again. It's, it's why she left Scientology or part of it was like the straw that broke the camel's back, wasn't it? That's right. And uh, Leah had gone. So like I said, Shelly was moved to this small compound out of sight in the late summer, 2005, the fall. And then um, Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes started dating um, that April. And then in April 2006, Surrey was born. And then in November 2006, they had their wedding at a castle in Italy. And Shelly and uh, Le Leah went to that. You know, Jennifer Lopez was there. And a lot of celebrities were at this fancy wedding for Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes. And Leah has written in her book about how she got there and realized, well, you know, David Miscavige is the best man, of course, but. Where's his wife? Where's Shelly? And this is like the first time she kind of realized that Shelly's not been around for a while. And so she asked about it. And one of the uh, top executives said to her, you don't have the effing rank to ask that question. And that's when she realized something was up. And she went back to her hotel room and she wrote up a report turning in the leader of Scientology to Scientology. It'd be like going to the Vatican, seeing the Pope do something and writing up the Pope. So um, they then punished her by demanding she go to Florida for three months of, of basically, you know, uh, what, what's the word we should use? Conditioning to get her to agree that she didn't see what she saw and charged her $300,000 for it. 
And all of this is in her book is that that was what then set her on her path to leaving. Now, like I said, that was 2006. And then I broke the news that she had left Scientology in July, 2013. Wow. Did she pay that money and do the conditioning? Oh yeah. Yeah. They don't, you don't yeah. have a choice. You're a Scientologist. 300,000. Wow. That's she might've got it back. And now that I think about it, I think she might talk in her book that she raised enough of a fuss that they re re refunded her, but they, she did spend millions in Scientology. There's no question. And so my understanding is that that uh, tweet thread that she released uh, related to this officer who who had been they, they'd reported to at the time, and now the suggestion is that he was in Scientology's pockets and didn't do anything about it. Well, we don't know that Corey Parker was uh, involved at all with the Shelley Miscavige thing, but what Leah is asking is, now that we know how corrupt he is, and it's just incredible corruption that's come out in in relation to uh, CBS's CEO Les Moonves. Now that that's out in the open, do an investigation and find out the other ways that he was corrupt, particularly with Scientology. It's just one of those things, Andrew, where we just don't know how deep that corruption goes. But even inside the LAPD, they knew that the Hollywood division was hopelessly co-opted by its relationship to Scientology. Wow, it's really got its claws into all sorts of different uh, facets of society. Um, going back to Danny Masterson then, so after the holiday, you go back. How long do, is that going to take? You're going to be back in, is it days and days? Are you setting aside in your mind? I'm going home for a week, coming back, and then it starts up again on the 28th. Um, at this point, I've set a return flight for a week later. I'm figuring they've got to figure things out one way or the other within a week. I hope I'm right because I hate to change it. It's expensive. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great work that you do. But my word, I, I was saying to you before, and you you, you refused to, uh, to, to, to say you were too stressed or anything. But uh, I mean, you're just doing so much work and it's day after day after day. So when, I think I speak on behalf of everyone when I say thank you for doing that work. You're getting this stuff out there. I mean, do you think, that the, the, has it been reported enough in the mainstream media? This is quite a big star and a big well, cult. You, you know, I hear, I've been hear, hearing people say that because I'm sitting, Andrew, I'm sitting in the back row, the media row with 12 other reporters and um, from great places. I mean, you know, Especially the entertainment press, of course, the rap, the deadline, Hollywood Reporter, all those folks are there. And they're doing very good stories. They're doing great stories. Um, but people are telling me, I don't see any coverage. And I think what that means is they're not seeing it come up in their feed every day on their phone, you know. And that's that's unrelated. That's got something to do with algorithms and stuff. I don't know why they're not seeing that coverage because it's out there. All you got to do is type Danny Masterson in a search engine and you'll get mm. hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of results. So many stories have been written. It is being covered, but I do understand people are saying they're not seeing it for whatever reason. Yeah, Leah Remini said it as well. And then people replied with loads of examples of, as you say, all the articles. But it's also, I mean, I suppose it's the algorithm, but it's also where the publications are choosing to put it on their, you know, the top or the bottom. So I feel like maybe they're not putting it at the top. I don't know if that's to do with the fear of... Of, of Scientology and retribution. Well, and they're stuff. there because of Scientology. No question. I mean, I talked to the reporters about this. I mean, the fact that it's been characterized as a Me Too case, and that's a little controversial because it kind of predates Me Too. But the fact that it's kind of a, you know, Hollywood actor facing sex allegations, that's, you know, right now we're looking at uh, Harvey Weinstein and Kevin Spacey and Paul Haggis and all these other ones. But the fact that it's got this Scientology element that he is a Scientologist and they were Scientologists and that the judge has allowed a certain limited amount of testimony about Scientology's policies, that's why all the reporters are there. I can tell you that as soon, <laughs> whenever Scientology is mentioned in the room, wham, everybody's getting that down because they're really, they, they know that's what people are curious about. Interesting. And well, I guess at the start, there was sort of, uh, I think I spoke to you just before, and I don't know if we talked about this, but that there could be ramifications for Scientology. It's got this tax exempt status, which it notoriously got, I suppose, by by sort of bullying the IRS in a way that I don't think anyone's ever done, and somehow winning. And that charity, that tax exempt tax exempt status, sort of keeps them going. But could a criminal charge affect them? Have you seen anything like that? Well, you know, I think what we're waiting to see is if there are convictions. Um, would other agencies then be interested in looking at the allegations 
of obstruction of justice. You know, I know the FBI has looked at this case, but they haven't done anything. Are they just waiting until the end of this trial? Perhaps. I don't know. Wow. What what would that what could that look like? Could they go well, in and well one one amazing example we got, one bombshell we got during the trial was um, I, I broke the news that Lisa Marie Presley was going to be on the witness list. But we really didn't know why. Why was Lisa Marie going to testify? I mean, I knew that she and Jane Doe 1 had been friends, but it still wasn't clear what she was going to testify to. Well, then, on uh, a couple of weeks ago, I don't know, remember which date it was, the judge asked the prosecutor outright what's going on with Lisa Marie Presley. And the prosecutor explained that they wanted her to come in and testify, and she was willing, that after Jane Doe 1's incident, she had reported her incident to the church, and then she had told them she wanted to turn Danny into the police. And, of course, in Scientology, you're not supposed to do that. And they had told her, don't do that. But then she was talking about she's going to do it anyway. Lisa Marie Presley was supposed to testify that Scientology asked her to dissuade Jane Doe one from going to the police. And when the prosecutor said that, we were just, oh, oh wow. And then the next big, the next big shock, the prosecutor said that Lisa Marie's attorney had come in at the last minute and said, look, if you're going to put her up on the stand and ask her about those things, I'm going to advise that she takes the Fifth Amendment. And in this country, Andrew, what that means is uh, according to the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution, you have an absolute right to silence and not to give self-incriminating information. So what he was saying there was that if Lisa Marie Presley got up on the stand and testified to Scientology asking her to talk a victim out of going to the police, she would be just not only describing a crime committed by Scientology, but one she had taken part in. And so the, the DA said he assured them he believed it was out of statute. It's been too many years. It was 2004 or something. But he, he went ahead and granted her immunity anyway. And so she gave a statement. She was ready to come in and testify to all this, Andrew. But then the judge said, you're not going to testify to that in my courtroom. Because she said it's more appropriate for the civil lawsuit where the women are suing Scientology over harassment and it doesn't relate directly to Danny Masterson and the criminal charges against him. So what a moment that was, because on the one hand, we heard this mind-blowing information of what Lisa Marie Presley's prepared to testify to, and then two minutes later found out she doesn't get to testify to it. So that was one of those moments in court where we couldn't believe it. And, you know, as far as the civil case goes, I think they, those attorneys handling, it's a different set of attorneys, they were no doubt thrilled to hear this and that Lisa Marie Presley has this killer information about Scientology trying to affect a criminal case. But I really doubt that it'll actually go to a trial. Scientology always finds a way to settle those kind of cases. And they'll fight it. They'll fight it and fight it and fight it. But once it gets to a trial, David Miscavige will find a, make, a, a way to make it go away. Maybe. Until but see, he so doesn't. The, the reason I'm bringing this up is we could, you could, they couldn't get it into the Danny's criminal case. There probably won't be a civil case. So the people who should be really taking a close look at Lisa Marie's statement is the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Department of Justice. Here's such rock solid information about how they will, the ends they will go to, um, even you know, obstructing justice. There must be an office somewhere in the corner of the FBI or wherever it might be where somebody's job is dedicated to exactly this and they're building a case for years and years and years and eventually all the cards will come falling down. No? Well, I mean, I know that they've had some interest in this case. It's just always a question of are they going to make the move to turn it into a real investigation and prosecution? And we see nothing, but again, maybe they're just waiting for a verdict. It would be like starting a war, wouldn't it? The FBI on Scientology. Well, that's, you know, Mike Rinder has said that. He said people always wonder, well, isn't if there's evidence of Scientology violating its agreement with the IRS, why doesn't the Department of Justice do something about it? And he says, look, put yourself in the place of the person who's got to make that decision. Here's some, you know, official of the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. He said, if you decide you're going to take on the Church of Scientology, you have to be prepared. That's going to be the rest of your career. 
That's yeah. all you're going to be doing until you retire. So it's a big decision. And so far, we just have seen no evidence of what, you know, what they're going to do. Oh, my word. The whole thing is mad. Um, I'll just say to anyone who's joining us midway through, we're talking about the Danny Masterson trial with Tony Ortega, the fabulous journalist from, is it the Underground Bunker? And you have a YouTube channel as well under your name? Uh, please sign up for free emails at tonyortega.substack.com. Uh, we call it the Underground Bunker, and that's where I put out my reporting now. And if you sign up for free emails, every story I publish will come to your inbox. You don't have to come to the website. So, yeah, and during the trial, I was putting out four or five reports a day. Now, now, don't expect that much from me. I'm just putting out one piece a day. But, it's uh, yeah, come join the, the, the Substack. It's really been a lot of fun covering this trial. Hmm. Probably better just a couple of emails a day. You don't, I mean, five a day during the trial, yeah, but you don't want five in your email bo inbox every day forever. No, That's the no, thing. No, exactly. I, I, I worry about doing too many uh, on the audio podcast of the, the audio version of this because it goes into people's phones, auto downloads. Like, oh, God, is it too many? I don't want to annoy people, you know, and all that. Um, and people, by the way, for, for the we've got about 20 minutes left. Uh, do ask some questions and I will try. It's very hard because I want to uh, maintain eye contact with Tony, um, but also want to, you know, at the same time, look at the side um well, well there's a question here actually uh which which uh, is w from rose bud ami rose bud bud ami um where where does scientology get their money from tony right scientology is very very expensive very expensive it starts out inexpensive you the first courses you take are maybe 50 dollars, but by the time you get to what's called the ot levels the upper levels of auditing counseling and scientology you're being charged seven or eight hundred dollars an hour, and it can take weeks. So to get to the top levels of Scientology, it's probably going to cost you a million or two. And then, how, do, how have they amassed so much money? Is that they pay their workforce almost nothing? I mean, it's pennies an hour, and they don't um, they they are not beholden to labor laws because they have that tax exempt status as a religious organization. So they pay their people almost nothing. They pay zero taxes. And then they have, they also, besides the high prices for their services, they also constantly hit up their members for donations, big donations. And David mm -hmm. Miscavige, the current leader, is actually very good at getting these multi-million dollar uh, donations from wealthy people. And, and that's his number one job is to make those well, I call them whales, wealthy whales, Make convince them that everything's all right with Scientology. So all the grand openings of new buildings and places where they don't actually have people, it's just to convince the wealthy donors that everything's going the right direction so they can keep giving the million. So between those things, the, the most recent estimate is this organization of only about 20,000 active members has got something like three or $4 billion in liquid assets. And I know... There was a story a few years ago about how the Mormons turned out to have so much money. They had like a secret uh, fund of $100 billion. But there's legitimately 30 million Mormons around, with, uh, around the world. The per capita wealth of Scientology dwarfs Mormonism or any other religion. You know, because you've got only 20,000 members, but they literally have billions. Wow. That is mad. Uh, and and it's part of, I suppose, why it's so important if they were to get that tax exempt status taken away, it would take a lot of power away from them. Uh, just say it was Rosebud Aim, presumably somebody called Amy, who likes Citizen Kane, I think it was, with Rosebud at the... Well, I won't say when, when that was, because that's a spoiler. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, no, the, the Rosebud he says at the beginning. It's just oh, you're not supposed to know what it oh, is. Oh, I, was, I was worried I was giving away I the, the ending. When, when the film came out. Yeah, was it 1940? I think so. 41. I watched a great documentary about Orson Welles on, on, on Netflix that I, I would recommend uh, definitely to people. We've got Devon Lara who says, Tony, out of the entire trial, what hit you the hardest emotionally? Oh, wow. Thank you so much for everything you do. I pay for your sub stack. Oh, there's a fan. Thank you. Thank you, Devon, for the super thing as well. Very generous and nice of you. That, that's a great question. And um, I felt each time one of the Jane Doe's was on the stand, it was devastating because not only what they were describing, but having to go through that experience of being questioned in a certain way and then cross-examined by the defense attorney. Um, and, 
you know, some of the things they said just hit you so hard when you think about, you know, somebody that they thought they knew doing these things to them. And as far as the thing that hit me emotionally, you know, Jane Doe 4, who allowed me to identify her, she's the actress Trisha Vesey. She's a veteran of independent film from late 90s, early 2000s. She was not part of the preliminary hearing last year. The preliminary hearing last year, I had seen Jane Doe 1, 2, and 3 go through their testimony. So this time I kind of knew it a little bit. Um, but I had nobody had seen her testify. And Andrew, I'm telling you, man, it was devastating. She was so compelling. And, and the fact that she broke down less on the stand actually sort of made it seem more okay. emotional somehow. Yeah. I don't know how to explain that exactly, but... Yeah, I, I was I was kind of a wreck after each one of them, but that one in particular. Is that something that you you find difficult? Has it become harder or easier over the years to sort of not let it get to you too much? Well, I mean, the part of what's going on is I'm typing down everything says as fast as I can, and so I have a job to do, and it's really you know busy, and so I think that allows me not to have to think about too much about what's going on. Um, it's, you know, it's a challenge and I've got to be aware of uh, things going on, you know, several times, uh, you know, the reporters, we all thought, okay, they're taking a break. And then all of a sudden we heard out of the corner of our, the judge is saying something, we got to get that down, you know? So it's just, you're so on the whole time mm -hmm. that it, it's, um, sometimes the awfulness of it, um, is, is, is a little bit easier to ignore, but not for these yeah. women, man, when they were up there, it was tough. I understand that feeling. I've had so many times in my own career when there's a camera on me and I'm walking around, it's like I'm a different kind of person or what. It's not really me. And I can sort of sit there and nod along hearing the most gruesome, horrible things. And it's only you sort of watch it back years later. And you're like, oh, my God, what yeah. was, you know, I was a robot. Let's uh, some more. More questions I've got here. What's this? I haven't read it yet. Is there is there a probable and realistic chance that David Miscavige will testify? That's from Canadian for Trump. Well, the criminal trial testimony is finished, and we're now in deliberations. Um, nobody from the Church of Scientology testified. There was one Scientologist who testified, but the testimony is finished. Now, as far as the civil lawsuits that the church is facing um, related to Masterson, and then there's another one in Florida, I'm sure they would love to get Matt, uh, David Miscavige in to testify. And if trials were held in those two lawsuits, that would definitely be a goal for the plaintiffs. But we're so far away from that for both of these cases, it's hard to say. David Miscavige has not been under oath testifying since the 90s, and that was in some depositions. I don't think he's ever been a witness in, in court. I might be wrong about that. But he's very good at keeping himself out of court. Mm, I just I wouldn't usually put this up, but it says you both look great. That's Barbara Bain. I think that needs to be said, particularly for you, Tony. Uh, particularly after the weeks that you've just had, you needed to hear something like that. Thank you, Barbara. Wow. <laughs> We've got uh, Laura Andrews. Thank you so much for the super thing. Uh, can you give a breakdown of the jury, male versus female in age groups? That's a great question. Will it make sure. a difference so in the verdict? We, we started out with seven men and five women, and then one, and then seven alternates. And then one man on the jury was replaced by a woman. And then later, another man was replaced by a woman. So we finished up with seven women and five men. Um, they're a mix. Um, there were some that look like they're late 20s, early 30s, and there are some retirees, so a mix of ages. And the, the ethnic breakdown is like four white people, five Latinos, two blacks and one Asian, something like that. It's a real good reflection of Los Angeles, I will say that. And mm. just the sort of appearance of them, I would say this feels like just a real normal mix of people you would meet in LA. Mm. And, and all 12 of them Scientologists, not really, just, <laughs> just joking. <laughs> Question from Nosferatu the Vampire, who's been one of he was one of my earliest viewers when I only had about one subscriber, and it was him. Question: What was David Miscavige's and L. Ron Hubbard's relationship like? Sure, Miscavige joined very young. His dad wanted thought that maybe it would help with his asthma, and they ended up in England. They were from um, Philadelphia, I mean Pennsylvania. They ended up in uh, England, where David learned to be an auditor, and then Miscavige, still pretty young, 
ended up in the California desert with Hubbard in 78, something like that. And they were making films and David Miscavige became a co camera operator. So that's the, how he huh. first came close. To, Hubbard was directing the films. David Miscavige is one of four, I think, uh, camera operators. And that's how he first got in proximity to him. And then he was part of something called the Commodore's Messengers, and which means the 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 Sea Org, the, the Scientology has uh, the largest group are called publics. These are people that just are members of the organization, take courses, but they don't work for the or the Scientology. Then there are people that work at the local facilities. They're called staff. But then there's a hardcore inner elite called the C organization. These are the people that are most dedicated. They sign billion year contracts promising to come back lifetime after lifetime. They work 365 days a year for pennies an hour. They're completely dedicated. And in the Sea Org, there's a hierarchy of various groups. And up near the very top, there's a small group called Commodore's Messengers that were actually you know, serving Hubbard directly for the things he needed. And so when David got in there, Hubbard took a liking to him. And then eventually, years later in the 80s, when Hubbard was in hiding, Miscavige had worked himself into a position where there was a there was a Sea Org officer with Hubbard named Pat Broker who would bring Hubbard's instructions to a parking lot in the middle of the night somewhere, and David Miscavige would meet him, take those instructions, and then go back to Scientology. So they had created this information bottleneck controlled by these two people. So really, when Hubbard died, there's a lot of different, I'm, I'm simplifying things, but really it came down to those two people. Those two people who had managed to get control of Hubbard's communications, Pat Broker, David Miscavige, one of them was going to win out and Miscavige was just the bigger, more ruthless guy and pushed Broker away. And so that's how um, Miscavige uh, became the leader of Scientology. And he's actually, I pointed out not too long ago, a few weeks ago, he has now run Scientology longer than L. Ron Hubbard did. Wow. Well, okay, well, then here's a great follow-up question. Stephen Harper, seems to me Scientology went downhill after L. Ron Hubbard died. Wonder if he if he was still around, Leah Rinder, Mike Rinder, that is, and the other and the likes other big Scientologists who left would still be in. Well, what does going downhill mean? I mean, it, it under Miscavige, it reached its greatest extent around the year 1990. He's the one that got them IRS tax exemption. So I'm sure there are Scientologists who would tell you that Scientology is even better under David Miscavige. But yeah, it has shrunk. Um, it's had problems. And that's a good, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if Leah Remini and Mike Rinder would still be in if L. Ron Hubbard was around. You do hear former Scientologists sort of talk wistfully about how things were under Hubbard. But then you talk to people that were around back then and say, no, he was doing the same things too. He was splitting apart families. He was punishing people. He was ripping people off. So there tends to be kind of a rose-colored glasses thing about Scientology under Hubbard. and um, But it's the kind of question you can never answer. I mean, there's just no question that Scientology under David Miscavige is this ruthless, money-obsessed, mafia-like organization that has driven away people like Leah Remini and Mike Rinder. Do we, oh, it's just a good question actually related to Danny Masterson trial. I've just lost it. Where is it? Claire Deloon uh, says, sorry, I'm late. Do you know how many jurors voted to convict and how many didn't? And do you think they'll try him? Well, he is going to be tried again. It, it, it's the same trial, isn't it? But do you know, do you know about the actual details within? No, we don't know yet. They want, there's no information on that. They are not done deliberating. There's no, it's not been declared yeah. a de deadlock by the judge. Um, all we know is they have not come to a verdict yet, and we have no information about the split. Is it 6-6? Six, six? Is it 11-1 to one for conviction? Is it 11-1 to one for acquittal? We have no idea. Now, when we come back and they give them a little more time to deliberate, then if they're still stuck, we may get some information about that. But for now, we have no idea. And I, I think this judge has not given up on this jury, and I think... I think she believes when we come back, they can still reach a verdict. So, yes, you know, if there is a hung jury, would it be retried again? We can speculate about those kind of things, but we're not there yet, Andrew. This this jury still has a ways to go. 
Okay, we will we will see watch this space. And then I love Legos, don't you? What a wonderful name. Question for Tony. During Cohen's closing arguments, did Danny Masterson, that is, move his chair to face the jury directly? Well, he usually does anyway. I, you know, I know there's people that come to the court and they're trying to read body language and what people yeah. are doing. But the way it's set up is there's a table and Danny sits right at the corner of it so that he can sort of face the judge, face the witness, face the jury. And it's I think it's just uncontroversial. I don't think it's a big deal. Um, and, you know, some of my other journalists have spotted some things, but I, I just think that the jury um, couldn't complain about what Danny and the family have done. Okay. Yeah, I, I like what you say with that, Tony, because there are so many people, I think, who rely on body language and things like that. And I'm sure there is some, there's some things you can learn from body language and all of that. But I think a lot of it's a bunch of hooey. Uh, you know, people are way too complex for that. I, I interviewed Amanda Knox on here. The amount of comments I get about her, the amount of comments of people who are just so certain, oh, haven't you watched the body behavioral video about her that they've analyzed that she did cartwheels in the prison? It's like, come on, people, that's not I think human. I Andrew, I think it's the ESP of our time. You know, it's just become so prevalent. People think they can read body language. And, you know, there was, um, I don't I hate to single them out, but there was one YouTuber that came to court a couple days, read the body language of the jury and pronounced there will be a verdict of guilty on Thursday, <laughs> Friday, the latest. And, you know, I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. We don't, we don't know what they're thinking. We don't, we no. have no idea what the split is right now. <laughs> someone's just written I've been waiting for Amanda to be mentioned I do mention because it, it just drives me mad that people are, it, it might be that they're right but not because of the body language it would be because she did the murder that would be what the reason would be not body language I, I and, and there are obviously there are some tells of course there are but it's nowhere near en enough for a conviction I mean it's sure. really natural people want to know what's going on in the courtroom to try to predict yeah. the future I understand that I'm more interested in what's being said I'm more interested in what the evidence is how the um the prosecutor and the defense are, are presenting things. It's been fascinating. I think uh, to me, that's enough. I, but I understand people keep, you know, well, what did they look mm. like? And what did Danny look like? I don't yeah. Know. Well, you're flying back out there in a week and we'll have to do another thing if you get the time for an update. Uh, sure. Tony, oh, oh, everyone, everyone hit the like on this thing. And also Tony, tell us again where, where you want them to go. Please sign up for free emails at Tony Ortega dot Dot com and you will get every story I publish right to your inbox. Oh, well, that's pretty. And you've got a YouTube channel as well, don't you? Yeah, I mean, I also put my videos and podcasts on the Substack, and then okay. I put it on YouTube the next day. So if you're seeing a video of me on YouTube, you're seeing it a day after the Substack readers have. So again, it's a way I'm trying to encourage people to come to the Substack uh, where they can get stuff real fresh right away. Oh, well everyone please do support my wonderful guest tony that i mean that's how we get all the answers without supporting people like tony we don't we don't know anything and they remain a an, an opaque cult that we can't see into so uh thank you tony for for coming on and for all of your work and everyone i'm about to do go and do a q a to celebrate forty thousand subscribers so this should redirect to that uh everyone who doesn't come along good night to you and uh tony thank you good night uh, to you as well well congratulations on that andrew Thank you. I'm clicking end. <laughs> Takes